Coming up in this week's show, we find out whether the Haval H1 is a great used buy. We go in search for a SUV that can steadily handle 4x4 trails. And we analyze a bucky with a noisy bearing. Hello and welcome to Buyer's Guide. We'll be tackling a fresh batch of your vehicle-related questions and queries once again. And here to help us this week are two familiar faces, Martin Pretorius and Tim Cozy Pansi from Audi Brambantine. Welcome gentlemen, nice to have you in the studio once again. Nice to be here. Thank you. And remember, if you like the panel's advice, you can send us an email to buyersguide at ignitiontv.co.za and please include as much information as possible as well as a photograph of yourself. Okay, guys, we're going to kick off things with a question from Winslow, who comes from Cape Town, and he's 30 years old. With a monthly budget of three to 4,000 Rand, he'd like to get into a fuel-efficient vehicle for the daily runaround. The Volkswagen Polo TSI being the first preference. He's also open to other suggestions, except for Suzuki-branded vehicles. Now, I don't know why he... Okay, let's move on to the next question then. Oh. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> then. But, okay, Martin, let's go with you. Um, Polo TSI. First of all, it's wrong about Suzuki, but let's set that aside. Yeah. Polo TSI, I wouldn't recommend for the simple reason it's a very high risk car in terms of theft. And there are question marks about them as they age. Reliability issues. Reliability issues. issues. Cost of maintenance. Cost so of forth. maintenance. Yeah. Like, so if not a Suzuki and not a Polo, I'd say in that case, so rather look at uh, 2021, 2022. You can actually get a Fiesta, Ford Fiesta, one litre turbo EcoBoost in that price range as well. Or even a newer Figo, so one of the run out models. Tim Corsi, you're nodding your head in agreement. Yeah, no, there's nothing wrong with the Polo TSI. Um, yeah. But then I will also go in the, the uh, Kia Rio 1.2. Yeah. In that sort of a price range, because you're looking at the car for like 180,000 rand or so here. Yeah. 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 Um, though I won't rule out the Suzuki, but we'll pack it aside, as Martin have mentioned. Uh, I know we talk a lot about Suzuki in this show, simply because it's a good, strong brand. Um, yeah, Hyundai i20 as well is another option you can look at, as well as the uh, Haval H1. So there's a bit of a scope in that uh, in that price range, uh, but as, as I said, for a, a VW Polo, it will have a bit of a mileage. Yeah, I looked online for um, <coughs> in that budget of like 180, 200,000 rand, because that's what three to four thousand rand is going to buy you. Correct. Now he didn't want Suzuki, so I'd say, okay, forget Suzuki. Have a look at the Toyota Starlet, because yeah. that's not a Suzuki. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is that a Suzuki? I, 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 had, I had that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have the Suzuki badge. But, yeah. but you can get a, a Starlet, I looked online, so you're getting something that's like 21, uh, 2021 model, 2022 model. models, yeah. with very low mileage, very reliable, very fuel efficient, mm. uh, and slightly more, uh, a better package Correct, than, yeah. than, than a um, TSR Polar. But there again, spacious as yeah, well. the yeah. space isn't it? You know, there again, you said uh, Toyota. Yeah. yeah. You said Polo. Those two vehicles I fall in the Fiesta. same category mm. of the high risk vehicle. So then buy a Suzuki Bellino. <laughs> yeah, buy a Suzuki Bellino. <laughs> but, but I'm just pointing out yeah, that yeah, the right. Toyota Starlet is going to be just as high risk as the Polo. Sure. So if you want to keep away from all of that, he should look at, like you suggested, the Korean brands. Yeah. yeah. I20. Uh, Kia Rio. About Even what H4. Martin said there about the um, the Ford Figo. Yes, the yeah, Ford Figo. Those last Figos were really, really, really nice cars. Yeah, yeah. they run out. Like Adam always mm. says, everything's found, all the problems yes. are sorted. It's yes. the best and, buy to, it's the best car to buy. Quite potent as well. I mean, little one, it's a little 1.5 litre three fast. cylinder, non turbocharged, simple yeah. engine. Yeah. It doesn't really give any issues. Well, there we go. We've given a lot of options and. Uh, I, I think it's, it's great advice. I think he's confused. I think he's now confused. <laughs> okay. Ian has his eyes set on the 2021 model Haval H1 with 15,000 kilometers on the clock at a cost of 195,000 Rand. He wants to know more about the reliability of the vehicle and if there are any inherent faults he should be aware of. He's also open to the, wait for you guys, Suzuki Swift, Hyundai i20, Kia Rio, and vehicles in the Honda range. He's aware that the vehicles aforementioned will have a higher mileage. With his budget of under 200,000 Rand, which would be the best buy? So the Haval H1, I think is most probably in that segment, just like our, our, our previous question, yeah. really a good car to have a look at because the Chinese brands have brought out cars with a lot of spec and tech in them. Mm. So you're getting a lot of uh, bang for your buck. It's a really good car to go and have a look at. What do you mm. think, Tim McCausey? No, no, spot on. I mean, uh, that H1 manual <coughs> is a compact, nice crossover vehicle. Uh, it's got the spec, as you've mentioned. Mm -hmm. 
and Haval is also doing very well at the moment. So there's a lot of uh, Havals out there. That means that there's a lot of parts components that are available. So you don't have to sit with the stress that, oh, okay, I'm buying a car and it's not popular in the country and the parts are going to be an issue or servicing the car is going to be an issue. Yeah. Everything is tech safe on these vehicles, as, as small as they are, and it's really, really valuable for money. So I'll, I'll definitely look at the Haval H1, but other options are also good. Um, our favorite in the show, Suzuki Swift. Absolutely nothing wrong with that vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, so <coughs> similar to, to Winslow, um, uh, ENJ has got some, some good options to look at, but H1 definitely is, 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 a, is a vehicle to go. Well, well, some background on the H1. It's basically an older Toyota underneath with Mitsubishi mechanicals. Mm -hmm. So it's got a nice combination of a solid body and solid mechanicals as well. Um, they do last a long time. They're uncomplicated. They're well proven. You can't really go on, go go wrong with an H1. So yeah. it's like so uh, if, if 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 Ian likes it, by all means go ahead. Just one uh, thing to watch out for is the boot space is extremely limited. Yes. Mm. Very, so he's also very, looking very, at the Suzuki small. Swift. Yeah, which, which has you get a, a block of battery in the back of that car. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the Suzuki's boot is bigger than that. Yeah, H1. Suzuki's mm. boot bigger than the block of battery. Um, so. That's the only downside, literally, with the H1. Um, I've driven them extensively in the past, and even in previous um, iterations as well, like a M4 and Florid form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I've known them for years. Um, they do last. They run pretty much forever with minimal issues and low maintenance. Uh, not terribly light on fuel, but inexpensive to maintain, and that kind of offsets the slightly higher fuel consumption. Mm. Yeah. So you can't go wrong with so that. I mean, but I think it's, 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 a, it's a car that we don't mention much on the yeah. show, and maybe it should be mentioned a bit more because it's a good value yeah. option, and it does, does come with a bit more spec inside. Yes. Mm. So when you're in the vehicle, you get a lot more features in it than you would get with uh, something like a, a Suzuki Swift or a basic I-20 or an I-10 or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Also, it's got that uh, <coughs> urban and, um, uh, and gravel road sort of a look vehicle because it's got a slightly higher it's ground slightly clearance. Higher the ground, yeah. Yeah. So you've, you've got both urban drive and of course uh, uh, off-road a bit, of course not yeah. 4 by 4 but just off-road, it's got those capabilities. So it's a very nice compact crossover vehicle, value for money as Martin have mentioned in terms of maintaining it. So it's definitely a buy. It's I also a solid think, choice. I also think, guys, we will need to stop saying, oh, the Chinese vehicle's got a bad rep, the Chinese vehicle. Yeah. I think that's done and dusted now. Yeah. Yeah. We should treat it like any other uh, vehicle on the market, and yeah. is it good enough or not? Fully yeah. agree. And like you mentioned, Martin, it, there's no serious or inherent faults, no. which is what the question was asked. Yeah. It's, a, it's so actually it's a as solid good, choice. Yeah, it's as good as any other car yeah. in its class. Yeah. Yeah. Well, except what Adam said about a block of butter in the back there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, stay tuned. Because <laughs> after the break, we're going to search for an SUV that can steadily handle 4x4 trails. And German and British luxury SUVs go head to head. You're watching Buyer's Guide. And if you just joined us, welcome to this week's show. Adele hails from Peter Marisburg and is in search for a reliable and good-looking SUV that can handle the 4x4 trails at the Kruger National Park. Adele has recently come across a 2018 Jaguar E-Pace and is wondering if it is worth buying. She is thinking of purchasing the vehicle and taking the warranty extension. Do you think that would make good financial sense? Okay, we'll let you know now. The Beijing X55 also caught Adele's attention and was impressed with how good it looked. Although the brand hasn't yet proven itself, is this worth giving them a chance? Also, does the Beijing X55 really have a Mercedes-Benz engine as mentioned by the salesman? Okay, go for the last one. No, no, that's not the Mercedes engine, Saggy. That's <laughs> distant related to an older Mitsubishi engine. A very distant cousin. So, but it's not the Mercedes-Benz engine. The Mercedes. Not at all. You so won't find the salesman trying to sell you something that he doesn't know about. Yeah. Remember Sang Sangyong? Powered by Mercedes. Yes. Yep. Well, in, or b back in those days, underpowered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's like that kind of a thing. You know. But, uh, Tim and Corsi, let's go to you. A Jag E Pace. As much as she might like, uh, Adele might like the Jag, but I'll look at a different option, right? Um, the, the Beijing 55, uh, good looking vehicle, uh, new in the market, and, and it's doing quite well. However, I'll throw in the spanner in the works and, and put in your Kia Sportage in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, look at the Tiguan as well, uh, all space, 
Um, and also another option will probably be in uh, a Q3 Audi that is still under plan uh, in, in that space as well. So, but for Jag, I think I'll, I'll pack it aside if I was Adele and look for something newer, something uh, more popular uh, and something that is that won't cost too much in terms of maintaining it. I mean, yeah. if you look at the extension of the plan, then the Jag, we're talking about 70, 72 72,000 rand. Let's right? just say there's a reason yeah. why this car that used to cost 900,000 rand now costs 470,000. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's <laughs> a good reason for that. That Jag is at that age where it will start costing money. You can also Correct. add to your list Hyundai Tucson. 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 Yeah. The last of the run out models of the, of the previous Tucson, I saw one of those for less than 500,000 Rand. Yeah. And that means you still get a proper warranty. Yes. You still get some, you get still, still get a lot of the maintenance plan. That's actually the one I would go for because it's, it's, it's because properly You don't have to supported. lay out another 70K. Exactly. Yeah. For, you and know, it's well get. supported with the wide dealership network. Mm. It's an established brand and it's a proven vehicle. Yeah, look, obviously, if you're looking at something like the, the, the bike Beijing X55, it's a Chinese vehicle, obviously. I'm sure you know that. <coughs> but if you want something that's all-wheel drive mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and it's got a lot of modern-day features, I mean, if you look at something like a Naval H6, Naval yeah. H6 mm -hmm. would come in. You can buy a brand-new one for the same sort of price you're going to buy a Jaguar. So yes. you can get the all-wheel drive version for your off-road ability. The thing I don't like about the Jaguar, it's most probably a great car to drive. Um, but the, um, the vehicle will have very low profile tires. Yep. So when you're going off-roading on it, it's Side. going to be horrible off-road because it's, it's designed more for highway driving. It's going to be terrible to drive off-road. It's going to be bouncy. And if you damage a tire, I can't even remember if that car's got a, a spare wheel. Um, a lot of the European it does. It does, it does have, have a spare wheel. Okay, cool. yeah. but, um, but it also has the <coughs> dreaded ZF nine-speed gearbox. Yeah. So you you know about the automatic gearbox? Thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. I was just going to mention, I've got two now that I've done the gearboxes on. Uh -huh. It's not worth it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so, so we run. wouldn't. Not worth the trouble. Run. What Thanks. we're basically all saying is stay away from from an, from a second-hand e-pace. I know it's a premium car, it looks cool and everything, but it's going to bite your pocket. Mm -hmm. In this sort of budget, you can go and buy yourself, as I mentioned, something like an Haval H6 brand new. You guys have mentioned like yeah. Hyundai Tucson's. I would also look at something like um, a Rare Four. A RAV4 is yeah. bulletproof, yes, reliable, yes. it's all-wheel drive, um, it's one of the better all-wheel drives because it does have a, a, a switch that you can go on to diff lock, mm. so it's, it's, uh, it's a, that's a great option to look for in terms of, of vehicle, but you won't get one brand new in the price range, you're going to have to spend a bit more if you want it brand new, but I think the Haval H6 is a great option, it's comfortable, spacious, it's a little bit heavy on juice, you know, but you say that she's going the car. all the way to an e-pace and spending the 70 grand on a uh, extended it's warranty. Yeah. So you guys can get upset here with me if you want to. I'll take, find an old Fortuna 4x4. Four four. Yeah. Well, it's a another option. GD6 yeah. or something yeah. like that. It's another that. option, but I mean, if you look at it uh, recently, it's, it's a high risk in terms of being hijacked. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'd rather have a Toyota Fortuna with the risk of getting hijacked than an E-Pace with the risk of not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's <laughs> <laughs> And on that, we're going to move on to our next question, which is from Elias. He's the proud owner of a 2020 Mercedes-Benz C63. He's only done 23,000 Ks. He recently had a baby boy, and he's now looking at buying a luxury SUV within a budget of 3 million rand. He has his eyes on the previous generation Range Rover Sport Autobiography or the new Mercedes-Benz G63. No, also, guys, he's open to other options. Sure. Martin, let's start with you. He's obviously buying for image, so I suppose a BMW X7 M50i wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility either. Yeah. Listen, I've, I've got solutions for Kenneth. Cool. There's two right. cars that he must buy, all right? An mm -hmm. Audi Q7 7 seater or an RS Q8 within that budget. Yeah. Actually, he will save money. He'll, he'll still get will he get an RS Q8? Absolutely. It looks like he likes the, the, the spec and the, the look and, and the power. Jeez. RS Q8, 2.854 million for the brand new one. Yeah. Now that you okay. mention those, if he still wants the practicality but he doesn't really need an SUV, he can look at an Audi RS7, yeah. which is brand new sure. for that kind of money. But he wants SUV. Yeah, but uh, I mean the RS7 is so much better than I any SUV. Okay, so there's a couple of options, other couple of good options. There are other cars as well, like he mentioned the Range Rover. I think the Range Rover in this sort of segment mm -hmm. is a really nice, super comfortable car. As Martin says, he wants something with image. And that'll give you superb image. Yeah. Um, Porsche Cayenne, you can buy a Porsche Cayenne with oh, 
you know, less than 10,000 Ks on it. So you've got a lot of change there for your kids' education in the future. So take that difference and mm. stick it away for the future. You know, I wrote down here as well, Q8, X7, also. Also, you can go for yourself something like an X5, which is a, you know, what you must consider as well is, is future on when you want to sell that vehicle. Mm. You know, mm. a car like a, an X7 is not going to have the resale value the same as the yeah. X5 yeah. because there's more people on the X5. Yeah. It's the same like you buy an RS Q8. It's a great car on that, but when you come to sell it, you're not going to get people wanting no, to buy it. But he's going to come back to me, I'll buy it. <laughs> no, you will buy it, but what are you going to give him? That's the next thing. But then there's one I want to throw in there as well. The new Land Cruiser 300. The new Land Cruiser 300 yes. is a go-anywhere car. Yes. It's, it does come with a good image. Mm. You're going to get to the top spec versions. You'll drive it. You, you, you'll give it to your son when he goes to university. Say, remember I bought this car when you were born? Yeah. Here it is for you. And it'll still, still be running. going. And then still his and son. And it'll still be a much wanted car. His yes. son can pass it on to his kid. His kid, yeah. yeah. And then so his kid can sell it on, on at like a thousand percent profit in yeah. 40 years. So, I mean, <laughs> and, and there you, you've got bulletproof reliability. Yeah. It will go forever. And if you want to go off-road, you want to go bundu bashing or whatever, car can do then it. just go. And it'll get you there. I so, can't see. What a lot of I'm in a Porsche. I'm going to say, tell you when I come to your bride, I'm bringing my Toyota. Man. It's yeah, well, this is South Africa. <laughs> Land Cruiser is boss here. Oh, yeah. Uh, 100%. Yeah. I, I mean, a Land, Land Cruiser must probably have the same boss. credibility as all the other vehicles. Exactly. Even more. You know. So there's okay. a great bunch of options for you. And uh, spend your three spend million your rand wisely. And if you want to buy an Audi, you know where Tembing Corsa is, Bromfitting. Give yeah. it a shot. <laughs> Stay tuned because after the break, when we return, we analyze the Chevrolet Bucky with a noisy bearing. And we help a viewer who wants to trade in his BMW for a used Mini Cooper. Welcome back to Buyer's Guide. Paul is from Cape Town and he recently bought a 2017 Chevrolet Utility 1.4 Bucky with 147,000 kilometers on the clock from a local dealer. After a few days of purchasing the vehicle, he found that the release bearing is noisy when it's idling, but when applying the clutch, it's quiet. He took it back to the dealer to get it fixed, where they replaced the complete clutch kit. The release bearing is still noisy. The day he bought the vehicle, he was given a six months guarantee on the engine and gearbox. Now he wants to know, must he take it back to the dealer? Or what's his next step? No, I just carry on driving until it breaks. Breaks, yeah. Of course you've got to take it back to the dealer. Martin, what's wrong with this car? Yeah, I'll take it back to the dealer. It sounds like the input shaft bearing on the gearbox. Yeah. Um, I believe that might actually be a weakness on those particular vehicles. Um, and if the release bearing was actually replaced and it's still rattling, either it wasn't replaced or it wasn't the release bearing. But the release bearing will never make a noise when not depressed. Uh, my mild alpha did. <laughs> So well, we're talking about uh, <laughs> Opel, Chevy, Bucky, yeah. So we're not talking about crap. Generally, what happens is if, if you have a release bearing noise, it will be when you put your foot on the clutch, because when you put your foot on the you clutch, there's activate. stress on the bearing, and that's when the bearing will make a noise. When you take your foot off the clutch, as Siggy says, it should be free of the um, pressure plate. In other words, it's not moving and uh, shouldn't make a noise. So when you put your foot on the clutch and the noise goes, and away. The noise goes away, what you're doing is you're disengaging your gearbox from the engine, so your gearbox stops turning. So your gearbox. So when you release noise. your foot off the clutch, the gearbox now turns, so now you're hearing a noise, which means it's coming from inside the gearbox, as Martin said. So it's a failure of a, an, a bearing inside, inside the, gearbox. the gearbox. It's, it's nothing to do with the clutch. I'm very surprised that the dealer decided, well, I'm going to replace the, no, the clutch. No, anyway, guys, according, that's poor diagnosis. according to the salesman, the clutch yeah. was replaced. Yeah. Nobody said they actually replaced yeah. it. Yeah. Mm. And we know how you guys salesmen talk. I, I was a we know I, how you when, when I saw talk. salesmen there, I said, okay, the customer was talking to the wrong person. Yes, the yeah. customer is no, talking no, to no, the wrong no, person. The customer must take that vehicle back and uh, go to the workshop, book the car to the workshop, and ask them to, to check. To the, look at the, it. Boy, yes. He bought it there, so they won't chase him away. You know? so, what, but when I hear the word salesmen and, and uh, hear you know, technicality with the bucky, I just said alarms. Right, yeah. because they he probably told the customer this what this is what was done, and you might find out that that was not uh, what was done in the field. You see, also yeah. what what you got to understand here is is often, and I find it in my workshops, the customers make a diagnosis. So yes. they'll come in and say to me, "My release bearing is is making a noise. Put yeah. a new release bearing in." Yeah. So if, like you said, they say that to the salesman, the salesman then sends it to the workshop, says. The release bearing is making a noise, replace it. So the workshop says, okay, they replace it. Correct. As opposed to going along, 
to, and this is for all you viewers out there, if you take your vehicle anywhere to get repaired, irrespective if you just bought it or you've had it for years, let the technicians, let them decide on what is the fault of the car. Don't go and tell them how to fix it. Go in there and say, I have got this noise. Please, I'll show you. Take them to the car and say, can you hear the noise when I put my foot on the clutch? Exactly. The noise is there or it's not there, whatever. Then they can make the diagnosis of it and they can repair accordingly. So in this case, it's not the clutch. It is the gearbox. Definitely take the vehicle back and just take our advice and go along and say, this is the noise that I'm hearing. I need that resolved. Let's say they did actually replace the clutch. Hmm. Somebody forgotten to put oil in that gearbox when they're sending that vehicle out. But if it was making <laughs> that's, that's the other and option. Afterwards, yeah. You see, another, another thing that the, the, uh, Paul must do here is to drive the car with the technician and show the technician when does this happen. Yeah. Yeah. Most of the time, yes. you say, no, I'm hearing this noise, but you don't, you don't say when do you hear this noise, when you, when you apply your foot on the clutch or when you change gears or when you go over. Huh? Get into the car and drive with the technician. Like Adam said. That's the take the car there and take someone with you yeah. and show them what's going on. And a side note, if, you, if it rattles with the clutch pedal disengaged and you just put a little bit of pressure on it and the rattle goes away, so the input shaft still turns, mm. but there's a little bit of pressure on the thrust bearing, mm. uh, the release bearing. So if that happens and it goes quiet, then it is the release bearing and they didn't replace it. So, I mean, by the looks of things, they have replaced it. I think the problem is within the gearbox, but definitely, your question was, should you take it back? Most definitely. Most definitely if it's take within it back. that six-month period and they've given you the guarantee, take it back. Let them resolve yeah. it. And more than likely, they'll resolve it for you. Okay, our last question is an interesting one from Brishalen, who owns a 2017 BMW 118i M Sport with around 42,000 kilometers on the clock. He would like to trade in the BMW for a 2017 Mini Cooper John Cooper works with around 60 to 70,000 kilometers on the clock. Guys, do you think this is an advisable move, seeing the fact that the mileage in the BMW is exceptionally low compared to the Mini? Richelin's reason for wanting to hop into a Mini Cooper is the upgraded kit and spec on the vehicle in comparison to the BMW. He's also interested in looking at the BMW 220D Coupe M Sport as he believes it has a more reliable engine than the 1.5 liter engine in the 118 high has to offer. Well, I'd say skip the Mini and go straight to the 220. The 220 diesel? Yes. I mean, that engine is so well proven by now. Mm -hmm. um, it goes like stink. It doesn't use fuel. I don't know what it runs on, but it's not really, <laughs> not really diesel. <laughs> um, it's, it's mated with a good gearbox, and the rest of the car is quite solid as well. It's really nice to drive, and it's definitely better to drive and easier to live with than a Mini JCW. Both, it's actually easy to live with both the other cars. Yes. It's most probably one of BMW's uh, most underrated models. products, yeah. actually. It's really good. Tim, yeah. what's your... No, no, I fully agree. I'm, I'm sure uh, Rashlin, uh, he still wants his back, you know, not so and everything else. Yeah. Um, I mean, to drive a JCW is nice, but then you're going to get tired of it. Um, you just want to get into the car, go to the no next uh, destination very quickly. Because it's, it's a tiring uh, a vehicle, it's hard. Um, BMW 220D Coupe M Sport, good looking car, get it with sunroof, black headlining, your navigation and everything else. It's a solid car um, and the 220Ds, they, they also go for, for forever and they are fuel efficient and yeah. it's more comfortable. And it's still sporty. Yes. And at the end of the day, when you want to sell it, there's a queue of people for it, yes. as opposed to the other cars, which are difficult to, to, to resell. Yeah. 100%. So, I mean, like you guys have mentioned, the JC, JCW, when you go to the showroom, you get into it, go for a drive around the, the block. Ow, oh, this is fun. Ah, oh, this is great. After three weeks of it, ah, oh, I hate this car. Ah, oh, my back's oh, sore. My oh, my back's sore. sore. <laughs> yeah, buy a 220D, you get more, because they've got plenty of power. Yeah. And like you say, they, they run on the smell of an oil rig. Yeah. Look, this 118, the, this 118 um, he has, it's not a terrible car. It's not an, uh, an unreliable engine. It's just a bit lacking, I think, it's just for bland. a car like that. It's mm. just, it's just a, yeah. It's there. Yeah. Well, and just like that, we've come to the end of another episode. Martin and Tim McCorsey, as always, pleasure to have you uh, guys in the studio fun. with Thank all the you. great advice you've given to our viewers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Until next time, remember to keep left, pass right, and please keep it safe on the roads. <laughs>